Mic check, one, two, three, four, check, one, two, one, two, three, four, check, mic check, one, two, three, four, check, mic, one. Thank you.
Honorable Judge Sarah B. Wallace presiding. Let me Thank you, Your Honor. 
Um, first, the parties have reached some stipulations. We will be filing those with the court. There are 17, pretty benign, but uh, it should help speed things up and make things more efficient. Okay. Uh, I can hand up a copy if you'd like, or if you'd like. They are fact, factual stipulations, Your Honor. Um, the next issue is the rule on witnesses. Uh, we would like to invoke the rule on witnesses, meaning that fact witnesses should not be present for testimony uh, in the courtroom. Uh, normally, that would be easy. You just keep people out of the courtroom. Uh, in this case, because it's streaming and people could be watching from other places, we'd ask for an admonition uh, that that not be done and that the parties alert their witnesses to that fact. Okay. Well, Expert witnesses, though, we would concede can stay and watch. Okay. Is, is that acceptable? Yeah, that's acceptable. No objection, Your Honor. Okay. So the court will uh, enter a sequestration order, uh, and it is incumbent upon the parties to make sure that the witnesses don't walk into the courtroom, but it's also incumbent on the uh, parties to ensure that their witnesses uh, don't walk onto WebEx or otherwise watch the proceedings uh, either live streamed or after the fact on YouTube, et cetera. Uh, and there's another issue on witnesses I wanted to raise, Your Honor, and this may actually shorten the hearing. Uh, we had two of our witnesses, I'm not going to name names, abruptly decide not to testify uh, last week. Uh, they asserted, well, may I approach so you can just see who they are? I've highlighted the witness names on the second page. Uh, these were two Trump administration officials uh, who were set to testify, uh, one at length. Uh, we don't think they're necessary for our case, but wanted to alert the court that they did a very abruptly tell us last week they were not going to testify. There have been some concerns about safety, uh, but I'll, I'll confess they did not say that was the issue. It's not very clear to us what the issue was. Uh, they had raised the possibility of executive privilege. Uh, that seemed odd to us since one of them uh, had submitted a declaration and no objection on privilege had been made. A motion to exclude that witness's testimony had been filed and no objection based on privilege had been made. So it's a little odd to us, but we at least wanted to alert the court. If we hear anything that gives us greater concern, we will, of course, bring it to the court right away. Okay. Uh, on experts, uh, as you know, we did not get expert reports. There was only one uh, from the respondents until Friday, uh, shortly before, I think, midnight, uh, we got a report from a Mr. De La Hunty, or Professor De La Hunty. Um, in the normal course, we would have filed a 702 motion to exclude. Uh, he claims to be an expert on the 14th Amendment and the history of the 14th Amendment. He's never written on it before. Uh, he doesn't cite much in the way of actual history in his discussion of the 14th Amendment. Given the late nature of today. <laughs> we can either file a short motion if you'd like or simply cross-examine um, Mr. De La Hunty when he testifies. I assume that will be either Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Uh, and then there were a few uh, issues on exhibits. Uh, in your order, I think, on October 27th, uh, you had asked us to explain why Plaintiff's Exhibit 131 uh, was going to be used. That's the uh, video of both uh, Rudy Giuliani and John Eastman on the ellipse on January 6th. They gave a speech right before President Trump uh, gave his speech, and they provided the basis for President Trump to say that Vice President Pence had the authority to get a certification of the electors. And President Trump referred to their statements in his speech endorsing them. That was also the speech in which Mr. Giuliani said trial by combat. Uh, and again, we're not offering those statements or that speech for the truth of the matter asserted, but for the effect on the listeners, the effect on Mr. Trump, uh, and indeed we don't agree <laughs> with most of what they said. Uh, we're offering it really for the untruth of the matter asserted. Um, and then there are two others, uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 73 and Plaintiff's Exhibit 126. Those were two videos that the court excluded in its most recent order, I believe. Uh, 
it was not clear from our submission, and we apologize, that those were both videos that were embedded in tweets that President Trump sent out. So they were retweets from his account. Uh, one of them, the fight for Trump, plaintiff 73, was sent out the very same day as the Will Be Wild tweet on December 19th. And so we think it is highly relevant as uh, speech of Mr. Trump. Uh, it was endorsed by him and tweeted out. Any response? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, before going to a response for a preliminary matter, would you like us to enter appearances on the record? I was going to. I was planning on doing that before openings, but since why don't why don't you why don't you respond to, to okay. these things and the lot of everybody appearances? And then we'll take a half hour for entry of appearances. <laughs> Um, so just, uh, and if I may, just talk about some of the preliminary matters we have as well. Um, uh, with respect to uh, the witness withdrawals, we feel the petitioner's pain. Um, and with respect to the uh, exhibits, we will maintain our objections, and, and I understand the posture of the court, um, particularly the objections with re respect to um, Mr. Giuliani's and Mr. Eastman's speech. They're not the ones on trial here today. We're talking about whether President Trump um, engaged in activities, not, uh, not whether they, and uh, they were not President Trump when they made those speeches. So we would uh, maintain those objections. Uh, with respect to 73 and 126, we'll have to take a look at that a little bit closer, Your Honor. I confess that I don't have all 100 and whatever exhibits uh, fully committed to memory at this point. Um, with respect to some of our uh, points, just to um, point out, and I know the court has been uh, very diligent in producing orders uh, and on issues, I think we still have the specific intent motion outstanding as far as that, um, as well as the First Amendment motion to dismiss. Um, I'm assuming the court will take those issues under advisement, but I want to at least point that out. Um, we have one witness um, who has concerns uh, about some of the um, legal threats that have been levied against him. Um, and so he's asked for an attorney to be present to be prepared to make objections to his testimony if the attorney believes it's inappropriate. Um, we're asking the Colorado Supreme Court, we will be asking them today to sort of expedite that process so that he can, the attorney can be admitted pro hoc vice. Um, and then once that's done, we'll probably come to you and ask for an oral admission for that attorney. Is that the person who? Filed the product motion on Friday, or is that somebody different? It's someone yet new, okay. Your Honor. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yeah, that's that's someone different, Your Honor. Um, it's witness of our list. I believe it's the second witness we've listed. Um, okay. Let me. I don't quite have that order. Yeah, it's the second witness that we've listed. Um, Thank you. I, and we expect, you know, estimates of time that he'll go on probably Wednesday or Thursday, so we're hopeful we can get that taken care of. Um, the other thing, and um, I know, I, I believe you addressed this before, some of our witnesses we may ask to call out of order based on schedule and the vagaries of the case. Um, I will say, um, you know, it brought us no joy to file that motion earlier, so I just want to tell you where we're coming from on that. Um, and I think from preliminary matters, that's it. While I'm at the podium, if you'd like me to uh, do entries of appearance for our cast of characters, I'm happy to do that or, or wait. Uh, are you prepared to enter an appearance for at least everybody on, uh, on President Trump's team? Yes, ma'am. Okay. If you can do that, that would be great. Okay. Um, so for the record, my name is Scott Gessler. I represent President Donald J. Trump, and with me, um, at the head of the table here is our paralegal, Ms. Joanna Biela. She keeps the trains running on time. Mr. Jonathan Shaw, who has been admitted pro hoc vice. 
Mr. Jeffrey Blue, member of my law firm. Um, in the back row, we have Mr. Chris Halbon. His motion was submitted. He will not be speaking until uh, he's admitted, or perhaps ever. Uh, but he represents uh, President Trump as well. Uh, Mr. Justin North uh, from our law firm represents uh, President Trump. Um, in the back, we have Mr. Mark Winter representing President Trump, and Mr. Jacob. I don't think I've missed anyone. Thank you, Your Honor. And why don't we just go to the um, Colorado Republican Party? Uh, just one person um, do the appearance with everyone. And I think it's probably best if you go to the podium. Good morning, Your Honor. I'm Jane Raskin with the American Center for Law and Justice. Um, with me today, also with the ACLJ, is Norman Melker and Benjamin Sisney, who's appearing remotely. Um, also with us are Michael Melito of Melito Law and Bob Kitzmiller of Padel and Padel. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Your Honor. Sean Grimsley, on behalf of petitioners, and with me is Eric Olson. Martha Tierney at the end of the council table. We have Nikhil Suss, Mario Nicholas, Jason Murray, and Derek Hain will be handling technology for us. Good morning, Your Honor. Grant Sullivan with the Colorado Attorney General's Office. With me is Jennifer Sullivan, Deputy Attorney General. We represent Colorado Secretary of State Jenner Griswold. I did have just one clarifying question on preliminary matters. The Secretary of State is a party to this case. She's also listed on the GOP's witness list. I just wanted to clarify that she's not subject to the sequestration order. She is not. Thank you. She's not going to be subject to the sequestration order. Thank you, Your Honor. Are the petitioners uh, ready to begin? Yes, we are. Great. Apologies, Your Honor. Give me one second to make sure we have the right thing showing in the right way. Mr. Chairman, do we need to turn the monitors on for seeing it on the. Or I think we're getting the output. We just need, I think, we need to turn these monitors. Just for everybody's um, edification, if anybody uh, doesn't want to stand at the podium, um, we do have a microphone that they can use. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Six Colorado voters, four Republicans, and two independents brought this case to ensure Colorado has a fair election among eligible candidates. Trump incited a violent mob to attack our capital to stop the peaceful transfer of power under our Constitution. That mob got within 40 feet of Vice President Pence after they chased him from the Senate floor. That mob tried to hurt and kill our elected leaders and we are here because Trump claims, after all that, he has the right to be president again. But our Constitution, our shared charter of our nation, says he cannot do so. 
And Colorado law says this court must ensure that only eligible candidates appear on our ballots. Now, this case has four basic components. Trump took an oath as an officer of the United States. January 6 was an insurrection against the Constitution. Trump engaged in that insurrection, and the Secretary of State enforces constitutional qualifications, and this court can order her to keep ineligible candidates off the ballot. Now, turning to the first element, there's no dispute Trump took an oath as president. That's stipulated. I'll address their novel claim that his oath somehow falls outside of the 14th Amendment later. And what happened on January 6 was an insurrection against the Constitution. That's not in serious dispute. Trump's own impeachment lawyer admitted as much. Many others have found it. We'll hear today and tomorrow from three people who were there that day. First are two officers, Officer Danny Hodges and Officer Winston Pangene. They fought the mob. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, you'll see. We'll also hear from Representative Eric Swalwell, who will explain how that mob disrupted the core constitutional process of the peaceful transfer of power. We'll also hear from Professor Gerard Magliocca. He is one of the nation's leading experts on the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. He's written several peer-reviewed articles on Section 3 and many articles and books on the history of the 14th Amendment. He will explain that when the 14th Amendment was ratified, insurrection against the Constitution referred to any public use or threat of violence by a group to prevent or hinder the execution of the Constitution. January 6 easily meets that standard. Trump assembled a violent mob that tried to prevent the constitutional transfer of power and did, in fact, stop that transfer of power for some time. Now, turning to President Trump's role in all of this, he engaged in this insurrection on January 6. He began by undermining the process for selecting our president and sowing doubts about elections. This early pattern of behavior shows Trump's use of common extremist tactics using language that played into existing conspiracy theories. He was a leading proponent of the birther myth about President Obama. He questioned the validity of elections, even the one he won in 2016, claiming he actually got millions more popular votes than he really did. And leading up to the 2020 election, he developed a plan to cast doubt on the results. And after the election, he quickly focused on the January 6th transfer of power to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power. In December, he started laying the groundwork for disrupting the constitutional process on this January 6th. On December 19th, he posted that there will be a big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there. We'll be wild. A week later, he talked about never giving up. See everyone in D.C. on January 6th. See you in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Don't miss it. Again, see you in D.C. These tweets continued. Big protest rally. Stop the steal. We'll hear about the importance of that language later on. Again, talking about the 6th, over and over again. Here he retweeted a claim that, quote, the cavalry was coming. We'll hear about Trump's invocation of military terms to support and rile up his supporters. More admonitions come to D.C. on January 6, over and over and over again. And then on January 6, he reposted his speech. Now, in addition, to this drumbeat of pleas um, to his supporters to have him come to have them come to Washington to disrupt the transfer of power on January 6, he made repeated deliberate statements to bring a mob primed for violence to DC on January 6. 
he refused to criticize the Proud Boys, an important part of the insurrection on January 6, in a presidential debate, and instead told them to stand back and stand by. <laughs> Stand back and stand by. Leading up to January 6, he praised the Trump train, which is a group of trucks that intimidated and forced Biden campaign workers on a bus off a highway in Texas. He tweeted, I love Texas with this video. Three, two, one, go! Welcome to the deliberately praised his supporters that used violent te techniques to intimidate political opponents. Again, leading up to January 6, he used violent, inflammatory rhetoric, rhetoric. He claimed that if this happened to someone else, they would consider it an act of war and fight to the death. Right before January 5th, he started six, I'm sorry, he started threatening lawmakers with the crowd he assembled. On the afternoon of January 5th, he said, Washington, who is being inundated with people, our country's had enough, they won't take it anymore. And he got even more bold a few minutes later when he said, I hope the Democrats, and even more importantly, the weak and effective rhino section of the public party, Republican Party, are looking at the thousands of people pouring into D.C. They won't stand for a landslide election victory to be stolen. And then he identified three Republican leaders by name. He threatened leaders of his own party with the mob he assembled. Now you will hear from an expert in political extremism who will discuss Trump's relationship with violence and political extremism. Professor Peter Simi has studied extremists for his whole career. He's written books, provided testimony at the January 6th committee's invitation, and he will explain how communications like we just saw and additional ones by President Trump fit into a long-standing call and response pattern that he developed with supporters where he instigated violence and praised those who committed violence against political opponents on his behalf. Now, turning back to what happened on January 6, once Trump brought the crowd there, he told them to march to the Capitol and fight. Let's look at two portions of his speech on the ellipse on January 6. Republicans are constantly fighting like a boxer with his hands tied behind his back. It's like a boxer. And we want to be so... Nice. We want to be so respectful of everybody, including bad people. And we're going to have to fight much harder. And Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Because you're sworn to uphold our Constitution. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them. <clears throat> because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. But I said, something's wrong here. Something's really wrong. It can't have happened. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Our exciting adventures and boldest endeavors have not yet begun. 
my fellow Americans, for our book, for our children, and for our beloved country. And I say this, despite all that's happened, the best is yet to come. So we're going to, we're going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol, and we're going to try and give. If the Democrats are hopeless. They're never voting for anything. Not even one vote. But we're going to try and give our Republicans, the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you, and God bless America. Two important features of that speech we just saw. First is his focus of the crowd on the actions of Mike Pence that were shortly to happen in the Senate chamber. And second, his repeated reference to fight and urging his supporters to fight. Now, I'm sure that Trump will claim that because he used the words, quote, peacefully and patriotically later in that speech, that he did not therefore engage in insurrection. That claim is wrong at every level. He used fight 20 times in that speech, peaceful only once. Professor Simi explains how leaders use language like that, like the peacefully comment, to create plausible deniability. It's just filter. Trump well knew how his reporters would respond. He saw what happened when he told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, and how they treated that as an endorsement. In fact, his use of peaceful in the rally, and again, use in this proceeding, highlights that he knew the power of his other words. If you don't think people are going to engage in violence after what you told them, or that your words will provoke violence, you don't need to say, be peaceful. They already will be. But that speech that we just saw got the crowd worked up and headed to the Capitol. I'll show you a video taken from the top of the Capitol at 2.23. You can see the timestamp in the upper left. So after the speech, the, Trump followed, the crowd followed Trump's orders and marched down to the Capitol. But as you can see from the video, much of the rally, what, they weren't doing much. They were just standing there. So what did Trump do right after, the minute after this video? He posted a tweet that incited the mob to violence. Again, channeling on the focus on Mike Pence he used earlier in the day. He described Mike Pence as weak and said he didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution. USA demands the truth. And look what happened instantaneously with this tweet. We see people read it in the crowd from bullhorns. They immediately started chanting, hang Mike Pence, and the violence began in earnest.
innocent explanation for that tweet that set the crowd on fire. We'll hear later today from Officer Hodges. This is his body cam at the exact same time. You can see in the upper right hand corner, it's 228. So within five minutes of Trump's issuing that tweet, this is what he faced. <laughs> Within 30 minutes of the tweet, we see the picture from the same vantage point we saw before. The crowd had overrun, but this was the back of the crowd. This was a crowd that was not the front line of the attack of the assault on our constitutional process. We have video which shows Officer Hodges within 30 minutes of the tweet. He had retreated to the tunnel was trying to defend the tunnel against this mob. is Officer Hodges, who you'll hear from shortly. This was an insurrection that Trump led. As we've seen, he summoned and organized the mob. He gave the mob a common purpose, disrupt Mike Pence's certification of the election. He did that by inciting the mob at the ellipse. He knew that mob was armed and dangerous. He told the mob to go to the Capitol with him. Once they were there and not sufficiently violent, he incited the mob with that 2.24 p.m. tweet and others that followed. And importantly, he helped the mob by refusing to mobilize resources to stop the attack. He spent three hours watching it unfold on TV without doing a single thing, even though he was the most powerful person in the world. Now, what does Trump say in response to this overwhelming evidence? 
says a few things. He says, hey, I said peacefully in the speech, so I didn't engage in the insurrection. And we already talked about that. That peacefully proves his intent. He then says, I wasn't there. I did not engage in insurrection. But he did. He kept quiet. He tweeted inflammatory statements that incited the mob and watched the mayhem unfold for three hours with doing nothing. He continued to try to pressure Congress to do the mob's bidding and overturn the election. And lastly, Trump says, others failed to protect the Capitol. So it's not my fault. There is an insurrection. He blames others. But it was Trump's dereliction of duty in violation of his oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution that caused the constitutional process to stop. You'll hear from national security expert Bill Banks, who's dedicated his career to the safety of our nation, studying how that works. He wrote a book recently called Soldiers on the Home Front, The Domestic Role of the American Military. He explains that Trump did not use the available federal resources. In fact, Trump didn't use the resources he used in response to other threats, like the Black Lives Matter protest at Lafayette Square, where they used tear gas and federal agents to clear the square very violently. Now, Trump is going to call witnesses, we understand, to say that he tried to put people in place to defend the Capitol before January 6th. That is not true. No record exists of him doing that. No indication that he used his vast power as commander in chief to do that at all. That is just an invented excuse after the fact with no evidentiary support. But even that doesn't matter. Trump cannot avoid culpability for engaging in insurrection by blaming the victim. Whether or not an insurrection occurred does not turn on how well defended the Capitol was. He ignited the mob, told them to go to the Capitol, and inflamed them with his tweet. Now, finally, Trump says the law, even if all that's true, the law doesn't apply to him. First, because he says he just was using speech. But again, Professor Magliaca explains the history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment in using robust historical sources shows that at the time of passage, 1868, engaging in insurrection included words of incitement or specific words of encouragement. That's what Trump did here. And in any event, it's not just Trump's speech that at issue. His conduct contributed to the mob's violence. His failure to act when his oath required him to do so led to the insurrection. Now, Trump brings an expert, Professor De La Hunty, but he's no expert at all on the 14th Amendment. Never written a book or a peer-reviewed article on this issue, on the 14th Amendment, more generally. Not performed any original history. There's no record of him studying this before he wrote a short opinion piece two months ago. Now, Trump next argues that the 14th Amendment doesn't cover the president, that there's an exception because it's a different kind of officer. Again, Professor Magliaca will explain why history contradicts this claim. It's nonsensical to create an exception for the most powerful person in government. And at the time, in 1868, there's widespread understanding that officer included the president. Finally, Trump claims that state courts like this one can't hear these disputes. Now, as we've talked about, he's wrong under Colorado law. Hanlon v. Gessler makes clear that the election code requires issues regarding a candidate's eligibility to be determined by the courts, which is what we're doing here. In addition to this bedrock law, we'll also hear from Hillary Rudy, who's the deputy director in the uh, Secretary of State's Elections Division. And she will explain the history of Secretary of State enforcement of qualifications and qualification challenges in court. And I think Your Honor will easily conclude that this action falls well within a long line of cases where courts decide ballot eligibility requirements. Now, our Constitution 
prevents people who betrayed their solemn oath, as Trump did here, from serving in office again. Colorado law gives these voters the right to make sure their votes will count by coming to this court and ensuring that only eligible candidates appear on our ballots. Trump engaged in insurrection and therefore cannot appear on the ballot. No person, not even the former president, is above the law. We ask after this hearing that this court find Trump is an ineligible candidate under Colorado law and order the Secretary of State not to place him on the ballot. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, so I don't have a highly produced video, but I do have a wor few words that I think this court should follow and think about in this case. Uh, the United States is the oldest uh, modern democracy, well over 200 years, far different than any other country in many ways. And what makes us different is the experiment we launched, which is this thing called elections. We have elections. And that means when it comes to decide as to who should lead our nation, it's the people of the United States of America that get to make those decisions. Not six voters in Colorado who have picked and chosen who they want to file a lawsuit against. And this court should not interfere with that fundamental value, that rule of democracy. It's the people who get to decide. And this lawsuit seeks to cancel that principle. This lawsuit is anti-democratic. It looks to extinguish the opportunity, extinguish it, the opportunity for millions of Coloradans, Colorado Republicans and unaffiliated voters, to be able to choose and vote for the presidential candidate they want. In fact, the leading Republican presidential candidate. And by many measures, the candidate, you know, most likely to win the presidency. They, try, they want to extinguish that opportunity by preventing him from running for office. It is anti-democratic. This is a case of lawfare that seeks to interfere with the presidential election. We argue here that this, at its basest level, this is election interference. The petitioners here, the six voters, have appointed themselves private attorney generals. They can pick and choose and file lawsuits against whom they seek to disqualify. And they rely on exceptionally weak and, and frankly, in some cases, fringe legal and logical theories to try and tilt the playing field of this election by wiping out President Trump's ability to run for election well before anyone has an opportunity to vote. They're asking today for a number of historical firsts. First, this is the first, they are asking this court to be the first ever in American history, in American history, to disqualify a presidential candidate under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I point, we've pointed the court, I believe, to, um, or we will, Horace Greeley, who ran in 1872 as a Democratic presidential candidate. He had paid for Jefferson, um, Jefferson Thomas's bail. He was roundly accused, loudly accused, of giving aid and comfort to the enemies of the United States shortly after the Civil War when he ran. Lots of debate on that issue. No one ever once thought of trying to disqualify him from voting. They took their arguments to the people for them to make that decision. Eugene Debs, Socialist Party USA candidate in, in, in four elections in 1920, ran from jail. He had been convicted of sedition for giving aid and comfort to enemies during the First World War by trying to stop military recruitment. He was convicted of that. He ran from jail. He was never disqualified. No, no attempt was made to disqualify him under, the, under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. The case of Eugene Debs is often regarded as a low point in American history, a low point when it comes to First Amendment protections, and for good reason. People should be able to run for office and shouldn't be punished for their speech. The petitioners asked this court to be the first state court in American history to disqualify a presidential candidate. 
They are asking for the first time in American history to disqualify any federal candidate, as a state court, to disqualify any federal candidate. This is the first time in Colorado history anyone's ever tried to disqualify a presidential candidate under the 14th Amendment. Asking the Secretary of State to go back and, and research a, a candidate's behavior, that's also a first. Never been asked or demanded before. Um, even right now, there are 50, about 50 cases, either pending or have been nationwide, specifically attacking President Trump. This is not a new tactic. Um, this is the first where a dismissal is not automatically, I shouldn't say automatically, but promptly been granted because of the weakness of so many of these uh, arguments. They're asking for the first time that the January 6th report be treated as evidence in this court, in a court of law, that politicized hearing. That's what they're asking, is that this court rely upon that as evidence. And frankly, they're asking this court to be the first in the country ever to embrace a number of legal theories that have never been accepted by a court, state or federal. There's a lot of firsts they're trying in this case. They're legal theories. I mean, we're arguing we shouldn't even be here. And we've argued that multiple times. This is a federal issue, perhaps the most federal, important federal issue we can have. And it's for Congress to set these standards, for Congress to provide guidance, not for the petitioners to come up with theories and try and convince you that they may be right. We've argued that the 14th Amendment is not self-executing and the preemption of political question, and we understand this court's ruled against us in, in every instance. Um, but nearly every court that's ever looked at presidential qualifications, and I'm not just talking about issues involving President Trump. Did you hear that line? I live in Denver, Your Honor. I understand sirens, unfortunately. So it's not just President Trump. Uh, you may recall that there was a little bit of controversy about President Obama's citizenship. And there was some controversy about candidate, senator, and presidential candidate McCain's citizenship. And there was controversy about senator and presidential candidate Cruz's citizenship. And there's one or two instances where those went to trial. But the vast majority of them were properly dismissed. The overwhelming weight of evidence is that this, should, this case should not be here. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of these specific claims. The claim that there was an insurrection. What constitutes an insurrection really needs to be grounded in historical usage. Because if you don't ground it in historical usage, you're just making it up. Now, I'm not accusing the court of making it up. I'm accusing the petitioners of making it up. But, but look, you will hear from Professor Delahunte that there are lots of definitions of what an insurrection is. It's been going on, that word's been in English usage for a couple hundred years, probably more. I haven't quite looked at the etymology of it. Um, <clears throat> and there are a lot of definitions. Your Honor, I submit I could construct a, a legal argument or a law review, to, law review article defending pretty much any one of those definitions. And when there are numerous definitions, that means there's really none. You might as well pick a definition out of the hat. And the petitioners have picked a definition out of the hat that suits them. That's their job. I get it. But frankly, they're making up the standard so that it fits the facts of January 6th. And I'm sure they'll try and come up with an argument that it'll just fit the facts of January 6th and it'll never fit any other facts and there can never be any consequences. But the bottom line is they're making it up and they're picking a definition out of the hat. What constitutes an insurrection needs to be grounded in historical usage because that's what the law demands. That's what equality under the law demands. That's what fairness, so we understand what the standards are by which we comport our behavior. Not post facto making it up to try and figure that out. The term engage. The term engage means to do something. Frankly, no one really knows what that means, but I think we can all agree it means to do something. That's what the word engage means. Okay? 
There's substantial historical evidence that engage does not mean mere incitement through words. It doesn't mean that. And frankly, President Trump didn't engage. He didn't carry a pitchfork to the Capitol grounds. He didn't lead a charge. He didn't get in a fist fight with legislators. He didn't goad President Biden into a going out back and having a fight. Um, he gave a speech in which he asked people to peacefully and patriotically go to the Capitol to protest. Now, I understand that there are several experts that are going to testify. And one's going to testify that President Trump, he just didn't do enough. He should have done more. Now, that's a case of Monday morning quarterbacking. But he's saying, oh, you should have done more. You didn't do enough. Um, should have done more. Should have done early, more stuff earlier. I can come up with all kinds of theories this professor will say as to why you should have done enough stuff. And that professor is no doubt a, a learned man and very thoughtful on this. But his basic argument when it comes down to it is they're claiming President Trump was negligent. Now we reject that factual claim, of course. And you'll hear that evidence that that characterization is completely wrong. But more fundamentally, the entire theory is wrong. The failure to do something is the opposite of the word engage. It's the opposite of the word engage. And, well, and we've argued engage requires specific intent. Someone doesn't just sort of stumble into starting an insurrection. They have to have the intent to do that. And you'll hear evidence um, that President Trump took very specific actions to try to prevent violence, to take precautions that he didn't want there to be violence on January 6th. And on January 6th, he called for peace. And he used the word peace at least four times in his speech at the Ellipse and two tweets and a video message. So he asked for peace. Now, the, um, the petitioners have played a couple videos. Cards are stacked against you, I guess. I've been here before, Your Honor. <laughs> I promise it's going to be an equal opportunity uh, problem. Well, I'm assuming your clerks are not timing, uh, taking time against me when the sirens go by. <laughs> Stop that timer, please. So my next point is, thank God we have a First Amendment. I'm very thankful for the First Amendment. Spent most of my career defending the First Amendment. Now, there's a reason it's the first, not the second, not the eighth, as I debate with my friends who like the Second Amendment. It's the First Amendment, and it's free speech. And I referred to Eugene Debs before. Eugene Debs was thrown in jail. He had to run for president from jail because of his speech. And it's properly condemned that case today. And in fact, um, even then, his sentence was commuted very shortly after the, uh, the election of 2020. None of President Trump's speech ever called for violence, just the opposite. None of it ever called for insurrection. Did it call for political pressure? Yeah. Did it use a metaphor to fight in the political context? Yes. And I don't think even the petitioners would allege that President Trump, when he says fight, he wants to get into a fist fight with people. Okay? None of his speech called for the overthrow of government. None of it. Any objective reading, the plain language of his speech, was clearly not directed towards violence. Now, the petitioners are going to have an expert, an expert on speech, an expert who says right-wing speech. He understands what right-wing speech, right-wing extremist speech really means. And he's basically going to argue when you strip away all of the academic language and you look at what he's saying, he's going to say, look, President Trump used a bunch of dog whistles. And, of course, a dog whistle is a whistle that has a very high pitch that humans can't hear, but dogs can hear. Okay? And he's going to say, President Trump like, had this sort of dog whistle. I don't know if he'll use the phrase dog whistle. But he used a speech that really these far right-wing extremists could understand and mobilize on. But us mere mortals, well, we, don't, we missed it. We didn't understand it, but those folks understood it. He's going to say that normal, sort of commonly used English doesn't count um, because there's this subjective, special language out there that is sort of underneath it all that um, has been unearthed by the sociologist. 
and only right-wing extremists and people very learned in sociology and right-wing extremism can understand. Um, and he's going to say that with his expertise, he's been able to decipher what we normal mortals cannot. And his decipherment is going to basically say that uh, President Trump was really ordering people to be violent. Even when he said peaceful and patriotically, even when he sent out tweets that said be peaceful, uh, that's not really what he meant. And the right wing, well, the right wingers knew it. He meant something else. This turns our American values on their head. It is fundamentally anti-First Amendment. He is saying that when we look at political speech, we don't look at it in an objective way. We don't look at the plain meaning of the words. We look at this secret, hidden interpretation that no one in this courtroom, or, well, I mean, maybe someone in this courtroom besides him can understand. Maybe he thinks I understand it and no one else can. I will submit I was in Georgia on January 6th helping with an election. But the right wing can understand it but no one else. That is anti-First Amendment. In fact, that has been soundly rejected by our courts, and properly so. We look at what people say as we commonly understand them. And the common understanding of peacefully and patriotic means don't commit violence and support your country. That's what it means. Let's talk about the history and meaning of Section 3. You're going to hear from two professors. Uh, you've gotten about 40,000 words of briefing on sort of the meaning and of Section 3. Um, you've rendered an opinion against us. And I understand, that's a conditional opinion. You want more evidence. And you want to hear more argument. And that's what we're providing. And so I'm going to ask you three things. All right? First, I'm going to ask you to reconsider your footnote 5 and your order. Yeah, um, um, I'm not, Your Honor, because I'm not going to take up the time. But I'm simply going to ask you to reconsider it, okay? I'll write it down. So Thank you. And I think those cases deserve a much closer reading, and I respectfully say I believe that they were improperly mischaracterized. Okay? So that's my first request. My second request is when you look at the experts, um, and our position, and, and I think the court ultimately agrees, is that they're testifying as to what the law is and what the history is. Um, and, and Your Honor rightfully recognize that there's other folks out there. So I'm just going to give you a lineup of the other folks. On one side, the petitioners cite Baud and Paulson and Graber, three professors, Baud, Paulson, and Graber. And on our side, we cite Tillman and Blackman and Lash. And I'd like you to take particular care to look at Lash's, Professor Kurt Lash's articles. Um, and because uh, he's done a more thorough analysis of the historic history behind uh, the 14th Amendment and Section 3, the congressional debates, and the ratification debates, not just what legislators said, but how it was understood by the public as well. You're going to get an overview of that. You're going to get argument on that. But I'm going to urge you to take a look at those others closely. And third, uh, as we've said, we think this is legal argument and not appropriate for rules of evidence. It's in. The court will, will make good, um, will provide its analysis. Um, and we have talked to the uh, petitioners about, just, frankly, including the expert reports, the law professors as demonstrative exhibits to review. That's fine. But I think what you're going to see is when I talked about the lack of firsts, um, there's a reason presidential candidates have not been knocked off or no one's even attempted to under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Okay, there's a reason this is a unique case. There's a reason cases like this have either never been brought or quickly rejected. There's reasons for that. And the reasons are grounded in the text and the language of the 14th Amendment. Um, you're going to hear about the Secretary's authority from Ms. Hillary Rudy. Um, this is sort of an interesting uh, case in the sense that my understanding is petitioners are calling Ms. Rudy and haven't even spoken to her. And we haven't even spoken to her. So it's going to be an adventure. But having had some experience in that office, I'm confident you will see that this case is a radical outlier from the Secretary's past practice 
in addition, obviously, to the 14th Amendment. Let's talk a little bit about the evidence before the court today, or this next week. To be sure, the petitioners have spent about 10 months preparing their case. As you have described, we've talked about this as a mantra. I'll submit volume does not equal quality. A lot of attorneys does not equal a good argument. A lot of stuff in front of the court does not equal good evidence. The court shouldn't confuse a vigorous effort with a good argument or with good evidence. If anything, the fact that they have to put on so much and make one inference and pile one argument on top of another shows the weakness of their case, not strength. After all the time they have prepared this case, this is what they've got. They've got the January 6th report. They got two police officers out of hundreds, perhaps thousands of police officers there. And not commanders, but two police officers. And they've got three professors, um, two law professors to testify about the law and the sociologist to testify about the, uh, the, the coded language. That's what they've got. And they've got one House member. I'm sorry, one House member. So that's what they've got. And at the end of the day, the start of the day, this case is frankly about the January 6th report. This is their effort to get court to endorse the January 6th report. That's what it comes down to. The video montage with overlaid sound that you saw in this opening argument, that's a pretty good production. And the reason it's a good production is because the January 6th committee hired a television producer to produce this stuff for primetime TV. The January 6th report made 411 findings, and petitioners have asked to introduce 408 of them, many of which this court has allowed conditionally and allowed argument against. But this report is poison, and I mean poison very bluntly. It is a one-sided political document of cherry-picked information, no adversarial process with a preordained conclusion. It omits a number of other arguments. It ignored other um, uh, witnesses before it. Um, and it ignores other explanations and causes. It has very much. Let me ask you this, Honor, and obviously I'm asking rhetorically. If someone walked into court and said, hey, here's how this court case is going to work. I, on my side, the prosecutor, I'm going to get all kinds of time, years, year and a half, to investigate witnesses, to take statements, to gather evidence, okay? And people who strongly disagree with my viewpoint, they get no time whatsoever. They don't get to interview any witnesses. They don't get to get any evidence. They get none of that, but I get all of it. I get to do all of that. And on top of that, um, you're not going to hear the case. I'm going to choose my own panel. I'm going to choose my own judges. I'm going to choose my Democrats and a couple of Republicans that agree with me. I get to choose them. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hire a television producer. And I'm going to time this for an election. And I'm going to put all that out there. And I want you to render legal opinions based on the quality of that evidence. I think you and any, everyone else would be rightfully would be repulsed by that process. But that's what the January 6th process was. And you are going to hear from a congressman involved in this just the deficiencies and the problems of that January 6th process. And so what the petitioners do, are doing is they're trying to shove this January 6th report as evidence for this court. They're asking the court to endorse that process. They're asking the court to endorse that one-sided, poisonous report. There is a reason Democrats, for the large part, love that report and cite it. And there is a reason Republicans, for the most part, hate that report and condemn it. And the reason why is that report is a political document first and foremost. This, however, is a court of law. Like you, we, like the petitioner's attorneys, have spent 
the majority, perhaps all of our adult working lives, as officers of the court, defending one of the greatest American institutions, one of the greatest world institutions, is fair courts that conduct themselves according to the rule of evidence, that work hard to come with good decisions. That's what we do. That's what courts do. That is not what the January 6th report was. And we should hold ourselves here to a much higher standard than that poisonous January 6th report. We should allow in only real evidence that's subject to cross-exam, is properly authenticated by people who actually have knowledge of that. That's what this court should be about, not importing a bunch of stuff from the January 6th report that really has little, if any, credibility. You'll also hear from two police officers, and we want to be very respectful of those police officers. But like any human being, they had a very limited viewpoint on what happened on January 6th. And we're going to ask that you limit the testimony to actually what the officers knew. Not what they guessed at, not what they summarized, but what they knew and what they saw. Their actual experience. And we'll point out that, frankly, I mean, there's a reason these officers are here, and it's because their intense dislike for President Trump. You're going to hear from a member of the House of Representatives, and we're going to give you a member of the House of Representatives, too. There you have it, Your Honor. Um, and then you're going to hear from three experts from the petitioners. Two are going to testify to the, what the law is, and then you're going to have the sociologist whom we've already spoken about. That's it. That's their evidence. At the end of the day, their evidence is a January 6th report. Everything they bring in is part of the January 6th report. I won't say everything, but the vast majority of it. Our evidence. I've refrained from naming witnesses. I'll continue to follow that convention. But you're going to hear that President Trump took very specific precautions to prevent violence on that day as president. Um, you're going to hear that the organizers of the rally at the Ellipse took precautions to avoid violence or inflammatory rhetoric. You're going to hear that the rally at the Ellipse was peaceful, that there was no violence. You didn't have a crowd that was intent on violence before or after President Trump's speech. You're going to see that President Trump's communications on January 6th called for peace. They called for respect of the police. Certainly, two police officers that were involved in violence, you're going to see that from them. But we also have at least one witness who's going to say, look, I, didn't, I saw very, very little. I saw a peaceful crowd. Nearly everyone was peaceful. That's a different perspective. And so it's impossible, we think, to say the mob did this, or, the mob did that, the mob, the mob. There are a lot of people with a lot of different actions, a lot of behavior. There was not a mind meld mob that President Trump supposedly mobilized. Um, and then you're going to hear about how the January 6th report was a completely partisan, unreliable document. This case here is about President Trump's right to run for office. That right is the flip side of the coin for people to be able to vote for the candidate of their choice. People can't vote without candidates. Candidates aren't really candidates if people can't vote for them. It's the same side of the coin. And, and so we've talked about the right for the people of Colorado to vote for someone for office. And that's very closely bound with the right of Donald J. Trump to be able to run for office. And the petitioners seek to deny millions of Coloradans that right, and they seek to deny President Trump his rights. Now, I understand the posture that this is merely a state disqualification case. And it's not. This is a 14th Amendment case, and it's dressed up as a state proceeding. 95 percent of the evidence is the 14th Amendment. Maybe it's 92 percent. But the overwhelming majority of the evidence in this case is about the 14th Amendment. And the overwhelming argument is about the 14th Amendment. And the consequences are about the 14th Amendment. And it asks the court to interpret the 14th Amendment. That's what this case is about. If it looks like a duck, and if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. This is a 14th Amendment case. Okay? And so I want to bring, it's a constitutional case. It's, sort of what we lawyers dream of being able to litigate. 
We don't dream in law school of litigating a Section 1204 qualifications. We dream of litigating constitutional law, and that's what this is. It's a constitutional case. And so I'm going to bring you to my last point. So I've been, uh, I'm old enough and overweight enough to where I've been litigating election law in the state of Colorado for well over two decades. And this is the third presidential candidate ballot access case I have litigated. Now, obviously, I'm familiar with the law nationwide. And there is a rule in election law. And that rule, it's all the rule of democracy. Maybe I'm making it up a little bit, but it's the rule of democracy. And that rule says that when something is close and when there's a unique and strange argument on the other side, okay, uh, when there's a question or an ambiguity or a stretch, the rule of democracy says we err on the side of letting people vote. That's what the rule says. Now, we've made preemption arguments. We've argued about holding office, that the 14th Amendment applies to holding office so that Congress has the choice to remove a disqualification. We shouldn't short-circuit that. We've made arguments about officer of the United States. We've made arguments about engagement, insurrection, First Amendment, all of that stuff. And to date, the court has either deferred those or oftentimes ruled against us. But what I'm asking this court to do is apply a rule of democracy. When something's close or ambiguous or a stretch or an unusual argument, you don't interpret it as a way to cancel the opportunity for people to choose their representatives. You don't interpret it as a way to cancel the ability of millions of people to be able to vote for the leader of the free world. What you do is you interpret it to allow people to vote. Because there is no doubt that the six electors don't like President Trump. And I would submit that maybe their attorneys don't like President Trump. And they're experts. And I know the police officers don't like President Trump. They don't like President Trump. And they have every right to vote against him. But there are millions of people in Colorado and across this country who are inspired by President Trump, who view them as, who view him as someone who protects their interests and who are going to, and, and is going to create a nation, help build a nation that they want to live in and that they want their children to live in. Millions of people look to him for hope and inspiration. And who are the petitioners to prevent those people from not being able to vote on that? Who are they? Well, we're arguing that they shouldn't be able to stop those votes. That when millions of people are inspired by a candidate, and millions of people may hate that candidate, what we need to do and what the rule of democracy says and what makes America great is we get to vote on that person. We don't stifle it. We don't short-circuit it through a court proceeding. We're confident that that's what the framers thought about when they drafted the 14th Amendment. We're confident that that's historical usage. We're confident that our legal arguments and our evidence are appropriate and carry the day. And part of the reason we're confident is because those arguments and that evidence fits within the long tradition of American democracy and of American law to allow an election to go forward rather than short-circuiting it and engaging in what we would consider anti-democratic behavior. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Do, do the interviewers, uh, does the Colorado Republican Party have a statement? Yes, we do. A brief one, Your okay. Honor. Thank you. That the Colorado Republican Party has intervened here, Your Honor, in order to urge you to vindicate the important and ultimate right of the party to select the candidates whose names will appear on the primary election ballot as Republican nominees for President of the United States. As the Supreme Court has recognized, under our political system, a basic function of a political party is to select the candidates to be offered to the voters. Indeed, a party's ability to select its candidates implicates the First Amendment right to association. And Colorado law is entirely consistent with this. Section 1204 of the Election Code requires the Secretary of State to place on the ballot, quote, only those candidates 
who were seeking the nomination of a political party as a bona fide candidate for President of the United States pursuant to political party rules. As the evidence will show, the rules of the Colorado Republican Party require a bona fide candidate to, sat to satisfy three categories of rules. First, the candidate must comply with the constitutional requirements set forth in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 5, namely that the candidate be 35 years of old, 35 years of age, be a natural born citizen, and have lived here for 14 years. Second, the candidate must reg register his committee with the FEC. Third, the candidate must demonstrate enthusiasm, viability, seriousness, and competitiveness, competitiveness according to certi certain party-defined standards. President Trump has satisfied each of these requirements, and the party has certified to the Secretary of State that he is a bona fide presidential candidate affiliated with the Colorado Republican Party. The Secretary of State has no basis upon which to thwart the party's political choice and deny him a place on the ballot. As the Secretary herself acknowledges, Section 1204 does not give her the authority to evaluate whether a bona fide candidate is selected by the Colorado Republican Party would be subject to disqualification under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment and for all the reasons articulated by Mr. Gessler, which I will not repeat, and we have briefed, um, the Constitution doesn't give the Secretary the independent right to do so, uh, nor does, does it authorize this court to. Thank you. Anything from uh, the Secretary of State? Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Grant Sullivan for the Secretary of State. May it please the Court. It's been said that this is an extraordinary case, and the Secretary agrees. I think the video that we just saw shows that. But in many ways, this is a very typical proceeding under the Colorado Election Code, specifically Section 113. As in nearly all Section 113 actions, a group of eligible voters alleges that an election official here, the Secretary, is about to commit a breach of her duties or other wrongful act. And like other Section 113 cases, a candidate and a political party have intervened to participate. That's not at all unusual. It's also not at all unusual for the Secretary of State or other election official in a 113 action to act as a nominal respondent and await the court's direction while the real parties in interest present evidence on the factual issues. Our pleadings cite three examples from just the last couple of election cycles. Consistent with this history and practice, the Secretary of State does not intend to offer any evidence in her own right in this case. The Secretary, unsurprisingly, does not have any direct evidence on whether Donald Trump engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. Other parties, of course, will present evidence on that question. What the Secretary can do and will do in this case is make her Deputy Elections Director available to testify on the election administration issues that the Court has signaled some interest in. We anticipate that the Deputy Elections Director will testify regarding how the Secretary's Office administers Colorado's election law to ensure conformance with federal law. And that includes the presidential primary provisions in Colorado's Proposition 107. Now, at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, the Secretary believes that Donald Trump bears significant responsibility for the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. But she welcomes the Court's direction on whether his actions rise to such a level as to disqualify him from appearing on the presidential primary ballot in Colorado. And she will, of course, follow the court's judgment on that question. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, before that, I just wanted to get your preference on uh, admission of exhibits. Was it appropriate to move for the unobjected to exhibits I referenced in opening now, or would you like to do that at a break? What's Your Honor's preference? 
Okay, thank, thank you, Your Honor. Honor. Your Honor, this is springboarding from the Secretary's uh, Council's request earlier, but our, our representative, Mr. Dave Williams, is also listed as a witness. We would ask permission to be able to have him uh, log in either online or view the proceedings. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honor. Mikhail Suss for the petitioners. Uh, petitioners call Officer Daniel Hodges. Uh, Nikhil Suss. Please state your name for the record. My name is Daniel Hodges. And where do you currently work? I currently work for the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C. And what is your rank? I am an officer. When did you join the D.C. Police Department? I joined the D.C. Police Department in December of 2014, so I've been on for almost nine years now. And what was your job prior to joining the D.C. Police Department? Prior to joining the D.C. Police Department, I joined the Virginia National Guard in 2012. I served a six-year contract and was honorably discharged in 2018. What divisions are you assigned to at the D.C. Police Department? At uh, MPD, I am assigned to patrol in the 4th District. I am also assigned to Civil Disturbance Unit 42. And how long have you been a member of Civil Disturbance Unit 42? I've been with Civil Service Unit 42 or CDU 42 since its inception approximately five years. And what is the Civil Disturbance Unit? Civil Disturbance Unit is an um, organization within MPD that officers are assigned to, uh, says platoons. We are activated and deployed to planned First Amendment assemblies on an as needed basis. Um, once we are there, we perform law enforcement duties around that First Amendment assembly, be it traffic control or um, just high visibility, making our presence known, and should they turn uh, riotous, we um, face that as well. And what duties do you perform as a member of the Civil Disturbance Unit? As a member of CD42, I perform all the duties that I just described. CD42 is also what's called a rapid response platoon. That means that we are issued uh, hard, hard gear pads that are not standardized for they're not standard to all um, CD members, so we uh, use those as well. Do you use any other sort of special equipment as a member of the CDU? I do. Uh, CDU officers are issued ballistic helmets, gas masks, riot batons, um, and then the uh, hard gear and pads I just told you about. And as a member of the CDU, do you receive special training? We do. Uh, CDU members are trained and ways to move in formations as a group, effectively utilize um, ourselves in uh, a crowd for, uh, for formations, and how to um, make arrests and um, protect ourselves and others in the event of a criminal uh, person assembly. Right. 
Does the CDU respond to civil disturbances anywhere in Washington, D.C., or only in particular areas of the city? Uh, typically, MPD's CDU units respond to areas under a local city, um, under the uh, control of the local city. However, we also respond to property that belongs to our federal partners should they request our assistance. I'd like to turn now to the morning of uh, January 6, 2021. Were you on assignment with the Civil Disturbance Unit that morning? I was. Were you aware of any proceedings happening at the U.S. Capitol building that day? I was. What was that? I was aware that at the United States Capitol that day, they were um, certifying the 2020 presidential election um, with Congress and the Vice President. And what were your initial orders? Initially, my platoon was ordered to respond to around 11th and Constitution in the morning of January 6th in a high visibility capacity, which means that we simply stood on Constitution Avenue, making ourselves visible, letting people know that the police were present. And about what time was that? Uh, we probably arrived on scene around 8 in the morning. And were you monitoring a particular event? We were. We were monitoring uh, Donald Trump's rally on the ellipse. As you were monitoring the crowd, did you notice anything unusual about how they were dressed? As I was monitoring the crowd, I noticed that there were multiple people who were wearing uh, tactical gear. Um, that some had helmets like my own ballistic helmets, goggles, gas masks, armored gloves, backpacks full of gear that we couldn't identify, tactical boots, some earpieces for radios, things of that nature. How did you feel seeing those people wearing tactical gear? Uh, it made me very uncomfortable, nervous. Why is that? Uh, because there's no need for all that tactical gear to listen to a politician speaking apart. While you were deployed on Constitution Avenue, did you have any other cause for concern about what would happen that day? I did. Um, while I was on Constitution Avenue, I was monitoring um, our radio frequency we were using that day for the uh, First Amendment Assembly. Um, I was heard our gun cover unit, our GRU unit, or GRU rather, was identifying people in the crowd who had firearms or that thought potentially had firearms. They were identifying them so that they could make arrests later on or um, at the time as need be. I also heard our explosive ordnance disposal unit, um, EOD, come over the air and say that they had identified a device on the Capitol grounds. They also said that the device was viable, and I took this to mean that they had found the bomb. Did the crowd stay at the site of uh, President Trump's rally at the Ellipse? Largely the crowd, um, after staying at the Ellipse for some time, flowed back in the opposite direction of Constitution Avenue towards the United States Capitol. And what was the general tenor of the crowd as they were moving towards the Capitol building? Uh, the crowd, as they were moving toward the Capitol, were moving with a sense of purpose. They, um, at, it seemed like they were moving as they had something to do there, even though the, um, ostensibly the event they were there to attend had concluded or come close to it. Was your platoon eventually deployed to the Capitol? We were. Um, we were monitoring the radio, and we heard our uh, commander that day getting more and more agitated as people continued to flow toward the United States Capitol. Um, he was, you could tell from the way he was talking, they were, the crowd was becoming aggressive and attacking and overwhelming the defenses present. Eventually, he um, requested CD-42 to back them up at the Capitol, at which time we went back to our vans that we used to transport ourselves, put on our hard gear, and made our way toward the Capitol grounds. And about what time did you receive the order to deploy to the Capitol? I believe it was about 1.30. And what was your understanding of why you were being deployed to the Capitol? We were being deployed to the Capitol to reinforce the defense there, to um, prevent people who were attacking officers from gaining entry to the Capitol. Prior to January 6, 2021, had you ever been called to respond to civil unrest at the U.S. Capitol building? No. What did you do after receiving that order to deploy to the Capitol? After receiving the order to deploy to the Capitol, we, uh, as I said, we went back to vans, made our way toward the Capitol grounds. We made our way toward the, I'd say, northwestern port edge of the Capitol grounds, 
where we got out on foot, organized ourselves into two columns, and started marching toward the west terrace of the Capitol. I want to focus now on the hours, between the hours of 1.50 p.m. to 3.10 p.m. Uh, could you tell us what happened uh, when you arrived at the Capitol building? When we arrived at the Capitol, as I said, we organized ourselves into two columns, started marching toward the west terrace. The crowd at the edges of the um, Capitol grounds were more spread out, um, less aggressive. However, they quickly identified us and started hurling insults at us, calling us traitors, oath breakers, telling us to remember our oaths, telling us to be on the right side of history. Um, and then but we, we ignored them and moved on. As we got closer to the West Terrace, the crowd became more dense and more aggressive until eventually we were attacked. Um, they, our assailants cut us in half, whereas the forward part of our element was able to keep moving toward the West Terrace. The rear portion, which I was a part of, was cut off and encircled by our assailants. And we were attacked at that point and had to defend ourselves there. Over the course of the day, how did the crowd attack you? The crowd attacked me in a variety of ways. Um, punching, kicking, pushing. I, uh, chemical irritants such as OC spray or pepper spray. Um, I was beaten in the head with uh, blunt instruments, including my own right baton. I was uh, pinned and crushed with a police shield. Um, I can't remember all the different ways in which I was assaulted. Did you sustain injuries? I did. Which injuries? <laughs> I uh, experienced pain and bruising about my body and a swollen hand. I had a um, large contusion on my head from being struck with my right eye baton, um, which I believe resulted in a concussion, as I experienced a headache for about two weeks after the fact. I had uh, lacerations in the face, bleeding from the mouth, and uh, pain in my eye from where someone attempted to gouge it out. Tell us what was going through your head when you were being attacked that day. I, uh, I was afraid. I was afraid for my life and for that my colleagues. I was afraid for um, the people in the United States Capitol. I was afraid for Congress, the Vice President, and what these people would do to um, them and how it would affect our democracy. Over the course of the day, did you see your fellow officers attacked? I did. How? In very much the same way as I was attacked, uh, punching, kicking, pushing, um, being struck with blunt instruments. Um, I unfortunately couldn't pay too much attention to the ways in which they were being attacked as I had my hands full myself. Over the course of the day, did you see the attackers use weapons? I did. What types? They used um, flagpoles that they had brought as a uh, blunt instruments to beat us with. They used stolen police equipment, such as riot batons, police shields to assault us. They used um, pieces of what's called uh, bike rack style barriers, which they had broken into its constituent pieces, the poles passed out amongst the, um, the mob to attack us. And uh, pepper spray, uh, chemical irritants, um, that's all, that's all I can think of. And you testified earlier that you saw people on the morning of January 6th wearing tactical gear, is that right? That's correct. At the Capitol, did you see individuals in the crowd wearing similar types of tactical gear? I did. And did you observe any behavior by the crowd indicating why they were at the Capitol building? I did, actually. Do you need me to repeat the question? Please. Did you observe any behavior by the crowd indicating why they were at the Capitol? I did. I uh, 
saw the crowd um, carrying flags uh, with Trump campaign um, slogans on it, advertising Trump for 2020, which was confusing as the 2020 presidential election was over. Mm -hmm. I saw them carrying banners that said, stop the steal. And it's my understanding that that's, this slogan means that the bearers believe that the 2020 presidential election was somehow stolen. Objection, Your Honor. Um, unless there's a basis for saying what that slogan meant to any particular person carrying it, that is pure speculation. Overruled. Um, but would you um, just make sure when you make the objections to uh, speak in the micro? Yes, Your Honor. And you I, don't need to stand up if you don't want to. I saw people carrying banners saying stop the steal, which uh, based on my understanding, that people believe the 2020 presidential election was stolen, which was confusing to me, um, as I was not aware of any evidence that this was the case. I saw, I heard them chant, fight for Trump, um, which seems very to the point. Um, they were carrying very various flags referencing war and revolution. <coughs> They told us that uh, we were on the wrong side of history when we were defending the United States Capitol and the peaceful transfer of power. Did members of the crowd reference Pre President Trump? They did. How? By the clothes they wore, the banners they carried saying fight for Trump. Um, they called uh, reference Joe Biden as a tyrant. Things of that nature. Over the course of the day, did you get a sense of how big the crowd was? I did. Um, it was difficult to gauge on the ground where I was, and I have no formal training in crowd estimates. However, when I was on the in front of the West Terrace, rather, I uh, was able to look out over the crowd a bit, and I could not see the end of them. Um, there were thousands, I would say. How did the size of the mob compare to the size of law enforcement uh, that were present that day? I was, um, this, the mob outnumbered us a great deal. Uh, I'd say 50 or 70 to 1. What impact, if any, did the size of the mob have on your ability to do your job that day? The size of the mob was the uh, greatest weapon utilized by the mob that day, or the rather most effectively utilized, I should say. The, um, had us completely outnumbered. They had us encircled. We were unable to escape should we need uh, to get out of there for medical attention. Um, we were unable to easily receive reinforcements. There were no uniforms differentiating people who were violent from people who were not. So the uh, mob aided and abetted those who were violent in that way, as those who were violent would then fall back into the crowd and we would be unable to engage them. Um, Officer, I'll just, just um, pause for a second so that I can throw the same objection trying to be made. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the objection is he continually talks about the mob uh, as if all the individuals in the crowd were acting with a single mind or a single intent um, when clearly it this is. This is a pencil cross examination point. He can use the words that he chooses to use to overrule. I think you probably need to remind him who he was. Uh, Officer Hodges, I was asking you, uh, did the size of the mob have your, uh, what, uh, what impact did the size of the mob have on your ability to do your job that day? That's right. It, um, it was the most effective weapon utilized by the mob. They, um, we had to treat everyone as a threat. And in that way, we couldn't focus on people who were violent. And we, our attention was divided so thinly that it was difficult to engage and uh, protect ourselves and others. How, if at all, did the size of the mob impact your ability to use firearms? The size of the mob made it extremely difficult to use firearms. Well, there were those in the mob who at times used um, force or assaulted us in ways that were likely to cause serious bodily injury or death. Um, 
we could not, it made it extremely difficult to engage them legally with firearms as we are not allowed to shoot into a crowd. Um, as the crowd was largely the main elements present, and very rarely did we encounter individuals that we could not handle one on one on one, it made it so that firearms were an extremely risky uh, proposition, both legally and morally. How, if at all, did the size of the mob impact your ability to make arrests? The size of the mob made it impossible to make arrests. When we make a custodial arrest, we are legally obligated to be safety, security, and medical treatment of our prisoner. These are things that we could not guarantee for ourselves at the time, let alone members of Congress and the Vice President inside, let alone, again, any prisoners we might want to take. Again, um, if we took a prisoner, typically the requires two officers to guard them at all times, and we needed every officer we had to assist in the defense. And so taking prisoners at that time was simply untenable. How, if at all, did the size of the mob impact the ability of emergency medical personnel to render aid to individuals at the Capitol? As far as I can tell, the um, Capitol was encircled. There was no way for medical personnel to access the, to access the Capitol. So the mob made it impossible for us to receive professional medical care. What about nonviolent people in the mob? How, if at all, did they impact your ability to do your job? Nonviolent people in the mob were still part of the crowd. They um, created all the problems that I had previously testified to. So, Officer Hodges, are D.C. Metro police officers required to wear, wear body cameras when they're on duty? We are. Were you wearing your department-issued body camera on January 6, 2021? I was. And was your body camera activated when you were on the U.S. Capitol grounds? It was. Uh, Mr. Hain, please pull up what's been admitted as uh, Exhibit 10 and pause the video. Officer Hodges, can you see the video on your screen? I can. What is this? This is, depicts me in my platoon walking towards the West Terrace on January 6, 2021. Oh, okay. I can go back and do that for this. Uh, so, Officer Hodges, can you see what's on your screen? I can. Uh, what is this? This is my body worn camera recording from January 6, 2021. And does the footage fairly and accurately depict what you witnessed on January 6, 2021? It does. Uh, Your Honor, move to admit uh, Exhibit 10. Your Honor, we haven't yet seen the video, so I'm not sure how you can state that it accurately depicts what we saw that day. Okay, but presumably you've seen it before and you've had access to it, so do you have an objection? Your Honor, may I speak? Sure, but in general I'd like to limit whoever is up to one party, but. <laughs> Absolutely. Your Honor, I understand the procedural posture in this case. Um, normally, you know, you listen to the video, he looks at the whole thing, and he authenticates it, then it's time for objection or admission. I guess our preference is, and I mean, I understand that this has been admitted already. I understand we've seen it. Okay. I understand. But just for purposes of the record, um, we think that may be the best way to do it. So. If you want to provide guidance on that, you're willing to follow Okay, so I want to make clear, you made some objections to exhibits, and I overruled some of that objections. That doesn't mean that it's admitted into evidence. It needs to be presented at trial to actually be admitted into evidence. And so I think that he's offering to admit it. I know, I assume you object. If you do, let's get it on the record and proceed. Does that make sense? There's text underneath it. Mm -hmm. If we can just listen to it and you know, if the text reflects what was said, we're not going to take it. Okay, perfect. So let me put it that way. Why don't we play the video? Please play the video.
Let's stop the video at 1359.53. Uh, Officer Hodges, let me ask you first. Do you see the numbers in the top right corner of the screen? I do. What are those numbers? The first set of numbers is the date, 2021-0106. The second set of numbers is the time at which the recording was taken in the 24-hour clock, 1359. In this 12-hour uh, clock, it would be 1.59 p.m. Now, in this point in the video, where are you headed? Currently, we are headed toward the West Terrace. And what types of things are people shouting in the video? In the video, people are shouting at us, calling us oathbreakers, traitors, telling us to remember our oaths, um, we're on the wrong side of history, that sort of thing. And how did you interpret those words at the time? At the time, I interpreted those words to mean that they, the, uh, People shouting us. Objection, Your Honor. Uh, his interpretation of, the, of those shouts is irrelevant to any issue in this case. The, the shouts were made, uh, but what he understood them to mean is irrelevant. Objection overruled. I understood the shouts to mean that the people who were shouting us, which was everyone in the mob that I could perceive, disapproved of us being there. They understood that we were there to protect the capital, which was ant antithetical to their goals. That by protecting the United States Capitol, we were somehow breaking our oaths to the Constitution, that we were traitors to the United States. And why did you and your fellow officers have your hands on each other's shoulders in the video? We put our sh hands on each other's shoulders spontaneously as the crowd became more dense and aggressive in an effort to try and keep ourselves from getting separated. Had you ever done that prior to January 6, 2021? No, we had not. Uh, Mr. Hain, please resume the video at timestamp uh, 1359.53. Let's pause the video at 140035. Uh, Officer Hodges, could you describe what we just saw? In the video, we were, uh, my platoon, rather, we were making our way towards the West Terrace when we were attacked by the mob. Um, I was assaulted in various ways that I've testified to, and someone attempted to steal my right baton. I wrestled with control of the baton and was able to retain my weapon uh, when we Fended off the initial assault, we were encircled by the mob, at which point they started uh, yelling at us, telling us that we're on the wrong team, which suggested to me that they uh, were going against our efforts to defend the United States Capitol. Uh, Mr. Hain, please resume the video at 140035. Let's pause the video at 1401.20. Officer Hodges, do you see uh, the man wearing a vest in the video? I do. What kind of vest is that? It appears to be an external carrier vest designed to carry within it a ballistic panel that would protect the wearer from the firearms. And judging from the way it's molding outward, it appears to carry such a panel. Okay, Mr. Hain, uh, please pull up what's been admitted as uh, Exhibit 11 and uh, hit pause.
Officer Hodges, can you see the video on your screen? I can. What is this? This uh, further depicts the, um, the time in which we were making our way, or trying to fight off the mob and make our way to the West Terrace. Is this your body camera footage from January 6, 2021? It is. Uh, did you review this footage prior to your testimony today? I did. Does the footage fairly and accurately depict the events you witnessed on January 6th? It does. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we would move to admit uh, Exhibit 11. Let's go back to 10. Um, you asked to admit it. I didn't rule. Um, counsel for Intervenor Trump, I think, wanted to wait at, to decide whether to make an objection. We have no objection to Exhibit 10. Okay. 10 is admitted. Um, I will. Sure. Uh, please play Exhibit 11. Pause the video at 1402.41. Uh, uh, now would be appropriate a time to move to admit, Your Honor. Is that the end of the video? That is the end of this clip, yes. Okay. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Uh, exhibit 11 submitted. Uh, Officer Hodges, could you describe what we just saw? Yes. Um, I had a uh, Attempted to forge a path through the mob for the rest of my platoon to follow so we could join the defense of the West Terrace. However, I looked back and saw that my platoon was again being assaulted by the mob. Uh, their forward progress effectively halted and being pushed back. I backtracked, started pulling off members of the mob by their backpacks until someone observed me and then assaulted me as well. We, they tried to steal my right baton again. We wrestled for control. Um, I was elbowed. We went to the ground, kicked in the chest, at which point I um, ended up on my hands and knees with the medical mask I was wearing pulled up over my eyes. So I was uh, blind for a moment. And looking at Exhibit 11 at timestamp 1402.41, what type of vest is the man wearing in the video? The man appears to be wearing an external carrier vest designed to carry within it a ballistic panel. And again, judging from the way it's bulging outward, it appears to carry such a panel. Uh, Your Honor, this, this video does actually contain more uh, content on it, uh, so I prematurely moved to admit it. Uh, and frankly, uh, to explain myself, I thought that these videos were previously admitted. Uh, and so, uh, but uh, could we uh, watch the rest of the video and then I move to admit it again? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Hain, please resume the video at timestamp 1402.41. Pause the video at 1403.20. Uh, Officer Hodges, did you hear what the man said in the video? I did. What did he say? He um, wanted to get me out of there. He, um, I told him, he asked me what he could do to help. I told him to leave. He said, that ain't going to happen. And he said, it's going to turn bad. And that the others were coming up from the back. And what did you understand those words to mean? Objection. 
speculative and he lacks foundation. Overall, that he can testify as to what somebody said to him, what he thought it meant. He doesn't mean that's what they meant. It means it's what he thought they meant. Objection overruled. I understood the, uh, the words he told me were very concerning. Um, he said that it was going to turn bad, which means that it was going to, he didn't think it was bad yet, that it was going to get worse. Um, he said that the others were coming up from the back. This indicated to me that there was pre-planning, coordination, and that they were intentionally encircling the United States Capitol. And when the man asked what he could do to help, you said leave. Is that right? That's correct. Why did you say that? Because aside from convincing other people to leave as well, that is the only thing he could do to help. His presence there was the biggest problem to us. The, he was a part of the mob, and the mob was the uh, Mr. Hain, uh, please pull up uh, Exhibit 12 and press pause. Uh, yes, Your Honor, at this time we move to admit Exhibit 11. No objection. And uh, now could we pull, uh, pull up Exhibit 12, Mr. Hain? Uh, Officer Hodges, can you see the video on your screen? I can. What is this? This further depicts the, our time on the Capitol grounds as we make our way towards the West Terrace, we being the remnant of CD-42 that was attacked. Is this your body camera footage from January 6, 2021? It is. Uh, did you review this footage prior to your testimony today? I did. Does the footage fairly and accurately depict what you witnessed on January 6, 2021? It does. Uh, and if we could play the video starting at 1403.57. Officer Hodges, could you uh, describe what we just saw? The video depicts me as I once again attempt to forge a path through the mob for the rest of my platoon to follow as we make our way towards the West Terrace. This time I was successful. Um, I was able to push my way through. We made our way toward the area in front of the West Terrace where we joined a police line being held. And could you describe what you saw in the crowd as you ran through them? In the crowd, I saw um, people destroying property, breaking down the bike rack style barriers into its poles, uh, which I saw in the day used as weapons. I saw agitator, an agitator with a megaphone, uh, encouraging further uh, violence. I saw um, munitions going off, uh, chaos, uh, no, one, no one obeying our lawful orders to go home. And the people in the crowd you were running through, did every one of them try to physically attack you? No. So did the peaceful people just peacefully standing there impede your ability to do your job that day? Yes. How's that? Even the people who were not, I didn't observe attacking us, made it difficult for us to analyze the threats, um, engage those who were violent, and... Um, because they, we had no idea who was going to come out or who would not. Um, the crowd made it um, so that the mob, when they fell back, had a defense that made it very difficult for us to uh, deal with. And did you hear the alarm sound playing in the video? I did. What was that? That is our LRAD system, which is like a loud speaker system. It's deployed. Um, when a first amendment assembly becomes unlawful or is unlawful, it broadcasts a very loud order to disperse, and I, it's very, very audible. And where the crowd was standing in the area depicted in the video, was that area open to the general public? No. 
What, if any, chemical irritants did the police deploy that day? That day, uh, I understand the police deployed OC spray or pepper spray and CS gas or tear gas. In your experience as a member of the Civil Disturbance Unit, do you, what do crowds typically do after the police deploy chemical irritants? In my experience, crowds typically disperse when confronted with chemical irritants. Um, it's very persuasive in getting them to um, change their minds about what they're trying to do. Uh, gets them to break up and to individuals instead of for continuing to function as a single group. Uh, Mr. Hain, uh, please resume the video at timestamp 1404.30. Let's stop at 1404.45. Uh, Officer Hodges, looking at the video, where on the Capitol grounds are you located at this point in the video? At this point in the video, I am in front of the West Terrace. And is there a police line shown in the video? There is. What, if anything, happened to that police line uh, that day? Later on, the mob was able to break through the police line. Uh, Your Honor, at this time, we'd move to admit Exhibit 12. Yes. Okay. Let's take a break uh, from 10.15 to 10.30. We're going to uh, resume probably afterwards. Do you need something, Mr. Kessler? No, I'm just... We're stretching your legs. I've had four glasses of water. So at 10.30, we'll be back on the record. Thank <laughs> you. 